in the earliest book of his talking of this uh, visiting the Linnaean society with Richard. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it's such an amazing building. And I had never been exposed to either the collections or the architecture of all these buildings. And then to find that when you go to Calcutta, uh, that, to Calcutta, that you have, a, a, you know, a very parallel architectural style in terms of the um, herbarium at Kew just reminded me of how closely connected we are and why don't we do much more about it? I mean, that's the main point, I think, of this whole exercise that we're doing, why it's being hosted by Ashoka University. And let's see how we can facilitate this conversation much more. So the store that we've had from, uh, you know, from Dumbarton Oaks to the Linnaean Society to other amazing botanic gardens, let's start from the very beginning, say at Calcutta, right? And see how Calcutta connects to the world and see the, the world from a different perspective uh, and to see how Calcutta in some senses wags uh, the dog. So uh, this uh, the, coming from that sort of premise, my sort of talk is on decolonizing national history collections of empire. And it's built on a very long standing, rather uh, difficult sort of engagement with um, institutions um, in Britain uh, in particular, uh, in terms of how do we sort of create a sort of collaborative level playing field in the context of what now has become very fashionable to call decolonizing, right? So the British intellectual engagement uh, with the uh, environs of empire, primarily India, Africa, the Caribbean, and Australia, over 200 years involved the use of the colonies for environmental experimentation. As we know, South, uh, South Asia, Africa, and Australia became giant open air laboratories for scientists attempting to understand, investigate, and manipulate a world of new people, species, environments, and diseases. So these encounters and interventions are permanent and sometimes adverse, sometimes beneficial, I will not uh, disagree with that, consequences on colonized people and their environments. The valuable and exhaustive documentation of environmental change, indigenous knowledge systems and practices of natural resource use laid the groundwork, as Richard Grove has shown, of much of the modern environmental thinking, especially in the tropics. So the continents of India and Africa, where, which came under colonial rule, thus provided much of the context of these debates on humans and nature, and India in particular became a template for other parts of the world. And I think this particular aspect is what I'm going to highlight in the context of um, uh, today's sort of talk. So what the richness of these collections, as I said, the largest collections in the Natural History Museum in Kew come from India. And it's not surprising because India was uh, very, very significant uh, to uh, um, uh, the, uh, to environmental experimentation and this this giant uh, laboratory that I've been just talking about, the environmental cultures of the colonial world and the intellectual communities of scientists who sought engagement with the novel peoples, landscapes, and species they encountered were highly organized and variegated. Responses to environmental change and novelty differed often fundamentally from territory to territory and continent to continent, but they were important common influences and networks as well, some of them dominated by the metropole and some brought about by hitherto neglected intercolonial patterns of intellectual and bureaucratic exchange, what now the AHRC in, uh, is calling the hidden histories of, uh, of these exchanges. And uh, a whole slew of funds has just come out in um, Britain to discover these sort of hidden histories. So a knowledge of the colonial natural history archives and patterns of uh, information networks is vital to understanding the colonial ecological revolution. While the documentations of individual experiences of colonial territories such as India is crucial if meaningful and comparisons are to be made of the colonial impact in different parts of the world. So what I'm trying to do today in this presentation is to understand this important archive of knowledge of the natural world collected and organized in the context of empire in the light of recent historiography on botany and empire. It also hopes to outline the recent project on creating an inventory and digitally repatriating botanical specimens held primarily in British institutions and to highlight efforts for cultural remediation. It examines neglected literature and networks in imperial scientific networks, which were crucial to what was a prodigious scientific renaissance in natural history and environmental understanding in the imperial context from the 17th to the 19th century. In doing so, it looks at uh, not just broader ideas of drying up, desiccation, colonial narratives of deforestation, soil erosion, and, and so on, 
but it also looks at the way in which uh, local perspectives were incorporated into these broader uh, perspectives on nature led by these colonial scientists or surgeons and ask very important questions about how do we question these colonial narratives uh, on uh, specifically Indian environments. So the archive of uh, natural history is extraordinarily diverse and uh, the historiography more recently has been explored as I, sh as I show you in the slide by Richard Grove, his book, Green Imperialism, which looked at the role of botanic gardens and environmentalism. Uh, David Arnold, The Tropics and the Traveling Gaze, which looked at colonial science and colonial appropriation, again, from very, very different points, because Richard argued quite, uh, quite interestingly that uh, the East India Company surgeons um, who were involved in understanding these novel climates brought with them a very precocious environmentalism. The exchange of the colonial encounter resulted in a very precocious environmentalism and environmentalism for him emerges in the colonial periphery. For David Arnold, on the other hand, the tropics were consumed as part of a, a sort of a attitude towards colonial environments, which was um, in, in some senses creating, uh, was part of the sort of colonial grace and created subject peoples and subject environments. Drayton's work is, uh, is uh, very, very, also very interesting, Nature's Government, which is on the whole ideas of improvement and the idea of the Botanic Garden. And more recently, Kate Telcher's book, which um, I would advise all of you to look at, The Palace of the Palms, which looks at the literary and visual culture of the non-European exotic as consumed and as displayed at Kew. So this rich historiography, I think, has come of age. And uh, I look forward to younger scholars uh, from your university adding to this rich scholarship, especially as some of the best, as I said, the most richest specimens uh, which we have are from, from the colonies and from India. So how do we sort of decolonize uh, uh, many of these uh, specimens held in herbariums around the world? Uh, how do we decolonize? One, of course, is to look at context of collecting. Context of collecting, and here, I'll be looking at 17th century collecting, 19th century collecting, and looking at post-colonial Indian botany by looking at the work of E.K. Janakimo, and then looking much more carefully at how the bureaucratic Indian institutions today are also sort of oblivious to how they need to open up their collections and to recognize the ways in which indigenous communities, uh, women, uh, the matrilineal tribal uh, traditions of uh, collecting uh, need to be highlighted in their own uh, engagement with, the, with this work. Very often, many scientists in Indian institutions have closed their collections uh, to even amateur naturalists and so on, which has been a real issue of stress for many uh, amateur uh, uh, naturalists and scientists. So I think it's very, very important that we have a conversation about how we engage with these specimens. And this is, I think this is particularly important uh, in the light of what we see as our decolonial exercise. So as I've said, this is a very rich archive. Um, it's got, uh, it's, it's extraordinarily diverse. Uh, as Richard would have said, it, it, you know, it's a veritable doomsday book um, in terms of uh, natural history information. In fact, uh, for him, the environmental history of India could be written by looking at some of these uh, amazing collections. And he mentions, for example, uh, William Hooker and Joseph Hooker's sort of work. So the information you get on landscape features, climate and weather information, I'll concentrate on more today on botanical and zoology, uh, botanical information, but you get botany and zoology, you get socioeconomic, literary, artistic, and ecological information, an extremely rich sort of archive. And when I talk about um, meteorological information, for example, William Roxburgh's papers, I think are particularly indicative of the sort of material that, they, uh, that exists. Scottish surgeon and botanist in Madras's collection details, um, for example, uh, the series of storms in 1787. Uh, Roxburgh was also uh, a keen, came, came to become the director of, the, as we know, of the Calcutta Botanic Garden, but this was his work in Madras, where uh, his, uh, he lamented in 1787 the loss of his various plant species as a result of this particular storm. I had made and noted on many observations on its uses, he writes, um, but um, uh, uh, many of his plants uh, were lost in, in, in um, sorry, many of his plants were lost uh, 
in uh, the storm and inundation at and near Coringa in 1787. So Madras Typhoon, I think, is very interesting because it tells you also much of this. Uh, much of this information also gives you data on what's happening in terms of um, storms, cyclones, uh, typhoons, El Nino events, and so on. So Madras Typhoon of 1787 was one of a very series of severe floods, which uh, which occurred uh, in this period, and he describes um, a violent inundation. Uh, uh, that, that no memory can recollect, uh, recollect any preceding instance of. The distress occasioned by the inund inundation, he says, was aggravated by the storm, which happened on the second. So this sort of information, I think, is, is, is also there, uh, which I think uh, it would be well worthwhile uh, doing an inventory, for example, of Hooker's um, climate data or of what Buchanan and Hamilton was, uh, was saying about climate. So for, uh, for uh, we've got a project at the Center for World Environmental History where we are working with the UK Met Office to understand uh, these, uh, the, the, or to, to, to dig into or mine these narratives for climate information. So what is, so some of the key themes then is how do we work through this colonial legacy for the imagination of new environmental futures? Why is it important to understand the context of collecting and to tell the story of plants, including information on its cultural, ritual, and medicinal um, uh, value with biogeographical distribution as part of wider e ecosystems? The gap between the vastness of the world and the smallness of the laboratory as one, um, as two academics have recently put it. So at the center that Richard and I started in 2002, we have attempted to make this remediation an international project by, by attempting to decolonizing these collections. The road has been extremely hard and very, very slow, uh, but we've at least been able to retell the story of Indian botany uh, from uh, a, a global South perspective, especially Richard has done that very effectively in his work. And, and, and so you can retell that story as emerging from its colonial origins and moving on to encompass um, indigenous and gendered approaches to Indian botanical history. So a little bit about our center set up, as I said, in 2002 as a center for excellence by the university. Its main area of expertise is the environmental history of the tropics. It's been funded by several different grants as Ramita so generously outlined. Um, more recently, we've also got a hidden histories grant uh, to look at the links between ecology, genetics, eugenics, and environmentalism, uh, especially looking at uh, the links between Holday and Amal uh, and Darlington. Uh, we run a regular series of seminars and we've got a network of senior associates, faculty associates, postdoctoral associates and visiting researchers. So once again, please get in touch if you're interested in the work of the center. Uh, Romita mentioned this particular network that uh, was funded by the HRC, the sort of, which has got about 90 members. That of course is an old image of the Calcutta Botanic Garden, which is the center of the work that we are doing. Uh, which is now, and we're working, of course, through the Botanical Survey of India. Uh, the HRC project, which precedes uh, the one that we have just got now, is looking at this archive uh, and, and trying to bring this uh, fragile and sometimes in in endangered arch archives and museums, uh, not just through, uh, through uh, making an inventory of them, but, uh, but to transcribe, collate, and digitize such archives and to preserve them and to make them much accessible to researchers, particularly from the global south. And this has required the center to become a, some sort of liaison person, liaising between Q and the BSI, for example, um, and liaising between different institutions um, in India uh, and uh, in Britain. Uh, the British Library has been very much part of our engagement with British institutions and has been an amazing source of support for us in this project. So that's an old image of the Calcutta Botanic Garden and you can see how beautiful it was. Um, I'll end with another image of the Calcutta Botanic Garden as it is today and we can talk about some of that in the discussion. But talking about the 17th century, um, uh, 17th century uh, collections, I'd want to start with the way in which, for example, you get um, uh, the Van Rida in the Hottest Malabaricus collecting plants in the 17th century. And this is a very, very, different um, aspect of collecting that you're getting, uh, which is very different from say the 19th century aspects of collecting. So one taxonomic text um, that precedes Van Rieders, uh, of course, is Garcetti Otto's Colloquius, um, 
uh, as uh, Grove notes, travelers were sent to various parts of the world in the 16th century to understand indigenous practice and to collect medicinal and herbal plants. Men like Garcia de Orta and Van Reeder later uh, uh, were, were engaged in this exercise. Garcia was a Portuguese physician who lived in Goa who compiled a series of plants. Um, I don't know whether I have an image of uh, Garcia here. I don't think so. So I'll just leave this image of uh, Van Rita here. So just to proceed, he was preceded, as I said, by uh, Garcia de Ota. In, in 1567, he established a detailed list of plants in India, and he, uh, which was translated into Latin by Clusius. And Clusius went on to establish botanic gardens in Vienna and Leiden. And the establishment of Dutch pine Cochin resulted in a new project in the plants of Malabar. Malabar seems to have been the place where a lot of um, uh, this early interest in botany uh, was uh, uh, driven uh, to look at. Uh, the close association of Clusius and Van Rieder and between Van Rieder and the Dutch political establishment ensured the diffusion of botanical knowledge between Southwest India and Europe. For Gro, far from imposing European systems of classification and perceptions on South Asia, the invention of printing and collation of regional botanical knowledge actually provided an opportunity for the diffusion of South Asian methodologies of classification through the European world rather than vice versa. So the importance of plant classification, which was taken from local terminologies become, becomes much more important. For Orta, indigenous medical knowledge was very important and even European and Arabic knowledge was superfluous in the face of local knowledge. So once again, highlighting in the 17th century sort of um, work on, on these collection or, or practices of collecting is the importance that both these um, collectors place on indigenous knowledge. Uh, for Orta, the colloquies on the samples and drugs of India has been described by one historian as the literary, medical and cultural text. The work presents 59 colloquies concerning more than 80 different drugs, fruits, spices, minerals, and medicinal preparations. And here he says that he relies particularly on a slave girl, uh, uh, what he is, Konkani slave girl, Antonia, for collecting. Orta notices the success of Malayali physicians in treating their patients, though he noted that it was difficult to gain information from them. Garcia was very aware of costs, particularly the Mali or gardening cost as being well-informed about local plant knowledge. So taking the knowledge back, as I, as I said, in some senses, to write to its local roots is what uh, one of the decolonial exercises uh, that our, our uh, sort of project is engaged in. So it was a Dutchman, Van Breeder, who ever pushed the boundaries of knowledge even further and took it upon himself to compose Materia Medica for the region. For him, the aesthetic qualities of Malabar Forest and its plants were unsurpassed. Malabar then was a garden for Van Rieder, and more than just that, a garden of the world. So com uh, composing the hottest Mal Malabaricas, a 12 volume illustrated herbal was a stupendous exercise for him. And his team, which included European engravers and, and native informants lasted 25 years between 1678 and 1693, a study that is now regarded as the first survey of tropical botany in South Asia. This has led me to believe Van Rieder said that this part of India was truly and rightly the most fertile part of the whole world. And that it was largely similar to the island of Taprobana, which nowadays is called uh, Sri Lanka, of course. We learn much more about the practices of collecting in this period through his work. Um, for any useful field identification or collection of particular plants decided by Van Rieder and the Hotters, their Brahmin inf informants, he noted, were forced to rely on much greater field knowledge of low caste servants, in this case, the Irvas. Brahminical natural science knowledge was as far as Van Rieder was concerned, merely academic. It thus made sense to bypass the Brahmins. For field cultivation, he relied on certain men who were experts in plants, who were entrusted with collecting from everywhere the plants with the leaves, fruit, flowers, and fruit for which they climbed the highest tops of trees. Having, I quote, having generally divided them into groups of three, I sent them to the forest. Three or four painters who stayed with me in a convenient place at once accurately depicted the plants readily brought by collectors. To these pictures, a description was added nearly always in my presence, quote close. It was Van Rieder's contact with these Irva um, collectors of the Toddy Tapper cast, adapted both tree climbing and plant identific identification, that seems to have awoken in him the wider value of knowledge possessed by this cast. 
The main figure in the hottest, and I know that many of you know this already, so I'm repeating it, but I, I thought it was worth saying, identify, um, uh, which he identified uh, was the Irva Vaidir of physician, Iti Achudan. And Iti Achudan, of course, signs um, the, his signature is available in this particular document. And the botanist Mirkez Mani, uh, Manila describes the hottest as a treatise that gives minute details about Kerala herbs concerning the description and illustration of 780 plant species. So the, uh, this, this, uh, what I want to highlight here is of course the, no, the importance of low caste epistemologies to this particular text. And later on when it uh, uh, sort of helps facilitate linear plant classification, how low caste era epistemologies enters global European plant knowledge. Um, one, uh, here's a, there's a thing, uh, an indigenous nomenclature very often uh, used um, uh, to, 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 for this. Um, Sita Reddy has just been mentioned and uh, in a recent, and I'm glad she's there, in a recent article and this amazing Mark volume, um, Sita Reddy tells us more about two artists of the or uh, original drawings, um, uh, Antonio Jacobs, Goa Kint and Marcellus Splinter, it's interesting that most of the European artists and engravers remained anonymous, while the native plant informants of the hottest were named in the text. And perhaps Sita can tell us more why this was the case. Some of the original drawings had local Malabari informants. Sita also hints at the complex prehistory of the hottest, where the Carmelite Matthews drawings were printed a decade before the hottest Malabaricus and appeared in print in 17th century botanicals of the time. So the complex practices of uh, 17th century collecting, I think are, are important to highlight here. Uh, which reveals the collaborative nature of the exercise, local native informants, European artists and engravers, and the diffusion of South Asian methodologies of plant classification in Europe that influence linear system of plant class classification. So in order to, to um, and, and, and keeping in view of the time, let's move very quickly uh, to missing out, of course, um, uh, the professionalization and state patronage of natural history that was ex exemplified in the 18th and early 19th century through Joseph Banks. Let's move very, very quickly to the 19th century where we get um, a very uh, different and interesting new phase where you get um, uh, Joseph Hooker's sort of plant collecting. So um, uh, people like Hooker, of course, were by the 19th century much more connected with um, debates that had emerged from earlier thinking about um, extinction, deforestation, and which had been formulated into government policy. And he, of course, uh, travels with Dalhousie on board. And Dalhousie, of course, goes on to set up the first uh, forest system in India. So these debates uh, were uh, to figure significantly in the uh, thinking of men like Joseph Hooker, who followed, Dar who followed following Darwin's visit to St. Helena in 1843, regretted the extinction of endemic plants on the island in part for the role they played um, in, uh, in evidence for mechanisms of evolution. So by now, understanding of plant knowledge uh, had moved beyond the materia medica of the early period, 16th and 17th century, to really understand the role of plants in evolution and to think about endemism and evolution. And Hooker is very, very important for this. So Hooker's collecting in India in the mid 19th century and his manuscripts are critical to understanding the environmental history of India and the emergence of climatic environmentalism. This is where becomes very, very important, um, where he, uh, he talks about, and he keeps a very careful weather diary as well. Uh, and you can, you can see that in his uh, manuscript uh, writing. His work is particularly important in understanding the biogeography, biogeography and climate in India. In the current context where many Himalayan plants are endangered and in the ICUN's red list, his flora of the region acquires even more scientific importance as it's not been repeated on an all India scale even today, they're still waiting to do the new flora of India as we know at the BSI. And it's, I think it's um, three quarters of the way through. So the last flora of India we have is Hooker's flora in 1872, which is uh, a great shame. His travel and letters in India between 1847 and 51 highlight the importance of India to the study of systematic botany. He aimed to answer the fundamental question in botany of what species the plant belonged to and where it comes from. He did this by delimiting species and classifying them according to the principles set out by him and G. Bentham. But what is, very, what is more important for us here is not just the work that he did, which is absolutely important, but his practices and which we are, we are trying to match his collections and his correspondence as part of a CWH project 
and to produce um, a high, highly quality digital collection, which Q has already done. We Sussex initiated the project and we now have Hooker's um, India letters have been completely digitized, available for scholars, and please uh, use them uh, at Q. Um, and this is, uh, we are very proud to say that Sussex um, sort of initiated this uh, with a 6,000 pound grant um, uh, about uh, nearly 10 years ago. Um, of course, the functionality of the digital catalog, as uh, Isabel just said, is could be much more improved and you could have a wish list uh, and uh, creating a much more richer metadata could be something that we could have, uh, we, we could look at doing. But uh, going back to the premise of this talk, which is highlighting the practices and prejudices of plant collecting, by the time he arrived um, in India, Huka, uh, by the time he arrived back in England in 1851, Huka had collected over 7,000 species in various parts of North India, including Sikkim, Bengal, and Assam. With fellow botanist Tom, Thomas Thompson in Assam, and with the help of numerous indigenous guides and collectors, they collected around 2,000 species of flowering plants, including many orchids, together with 150 ferns and many mosses, lichens, and fungi. In the course of his travels, Hooker had discovered plants growing at higher altitudes than anyone had previously believed possible, herbaceous plants growing as high as 18,000 feet, and some crypto cryptograms growing even higher. He also had drawings of over 700 plants plus sketches of landscape, geology, and the local peoples. The first sketch of Mount Everest apparently is taken by him. In 1853, he estimated that there were no more than 50,000 instead of uh, 70 to 100,000 known species of plants. A brilliant plant geographer, he drew meaningful comparisons between the flora of different regions. He was a crusader against species mongering while discovering 25 species of rhodendron, rhododendron, which now is a sort of a completely covered the gardens in this country, in England, um, and uh, the genius impatience. When we examine his use of native plant names, what becomes apparent is the loss of indigenous nomenclature, which I try to highlight in 17th century practices of collecting. Uh, and in the intervening period, we seem to have lost this sort of uh, interest in local, uh, in how plants were collected locally or naming local informants, uh, highlighting the change in collection practices and the increasing racialization of indigenous informants. So where Van Breeder had celebrated Irva plant names and Irva classification, Hooker was irritated by native appellations and saw them as unscientific despite use, using them. He had a dismissive attitude to native plant collectors and native artists and native nomenclature, noting in his records that native names had been retained with great unwillingness, quote close. At the same time, he romanticized the lectures, plant collectors of Sikkim, as in 1849, where he talks of being surrounded by my lectures while he inspects the contents of his vascular. So this became the subject of the Staler painting of Hooker in the Himalayas, his remarks on the people of uh, Ding Chuan bordering Tibet as being uncouth, I quote, boisterous, and could be kept in order by great bullying, quote close, is another case in point. He was unable to speak any Indian languages, unlike Thompson and only a smattering of Tibetan. Though native artists carefully drew plant illustrations under J.F. Kalkart's directions, Hooker was critical of their skills. His drawings on in India, however, an outstanding source on local ecology and landscape. Uh, as, as I mentioned, his drawing on Mount Everest, as well as collecting plants who could have regular measurements of temperature and other meteorological readings, which he sent to Professor Wheatstone, co-inventor of the electric tele telegraph, telling him, my objects are clearly botanical, but I hope by the careful use of good instruments to obtain da data for the calculating the effects of climate on the effect of vegetation of large areas. His intention was also to understand the geography of plant distribution. So Hooker's ideas of climate and biogeography were influenced, of course, by Alexander von Humboldt, who we've heard in an earlier paper referred to, and Charles Darwin, the latter being a friend. A close relationship between Hooker and Darwin, who visited St. Helena, had developed over the years. Hooker, the great German traveler and environmental philosopher, had in the early 19th century espoused a great interest in deforestation. Humboldt was able to use, I quote, the system of the lake, watershed, and forest as a geomorphological model much as the French and British naturalists had effectively used the oceanic island as a model for understanding physiogeographical processes, says Grove. Hooker, as well as be had become very interested in tree planting, and it's not surprising that we find him trying to prevent the clearing and extinction of plants from St. Helena to protect its endemic species. So this link between um, uh, deforestation, climate, is very much becomes part of sort of Hooker's agenda and he's quite a central figure in the development of state environmentalism in India, 
when he arrived there in the company of Lord Dalhousie, who already referred to, he used Humboldtian ideas and was influenced by Humboldtian environmentalism on the impact of the destruction of forests in the tropics. So Himalayas, so Hooker's Himalayan work, as I said, has, has got particular resonance today in the context of um, the uh, ICUN's endangered list. Current floristic estimates in India and the Himalayan region can be matched against Hooker's flora, flora indica by Hooker and Thomas Thompson as very important contemporary relevance. So despite his erasure, erasure of, of this, we, um, we can see why he is so significant to us. I've spoken about all these things, um, so I'll just move on. So let's now move on to my third, uh, given the fact of that, the third um, person I want to talk about, G.E.K. Johnny K. Amal, and how the practices of collecting the 19th century shift in the 20th century, and looking at Indian botany at the cusp of empire. So whilst economic and commercial uh, re uh, reasons uh, became to dominate um, um, British botany vis-a-vis -vis India uh, in the, by the latter half of the 19th century, Hooker's collecting was part of the Victoria's, uh, Victorian era's zest for acquiring plant knowledge for commercial purposes. Um, there, uh, th this was a knowledge refracted through a lens of empire. The decentering of this perspective had to wait until the remarkable career of Janaki Amal, a female botanist from the lower caste who became part of a global botanical network and grew to challenge both imperial and Brahminical networks of empire. So she is, of course, extremely interesting. Um, so the intellectual effervescence, effervescence and the discovery of cytogenetics produced remarkable individuals, and one of them was her. The, the two were European men at the peak of their careers in the biological sciences, and the third was an unknown Indian woman scientist of mixed race and so-called lower caste or origins, E.K. Johnny Kimball. So their equivocal encounters and discussions on biology, eugenics, philosophy, and politics highlights the cosmopolitan nature of science in the empire, a cosmopolitanism that is surprising given the dominant racial ideas of the time, and one was that uh, one was that was lost as narrow utilitarian perspectives of a national science came to dominate Indian independence. So what is what is what we know about um, E.K. John E.K. Mal? Um, she um, was born into uh, a Thea family in Madras. She uh, uh, goes to Women's Christian College um, in, 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 sorry, born to a, a Kera family in Telichery, a Thea family in Telichery. She goes to Women's Christian College Madras in the early 1920s where she receives a scholarship from Michigan University uh, and an MA in 1925. And, when, and she returns there to complete her DSC in 1931. And while at Michigan, she worked under Harry, uh, Harley, Harry Harris Bartlett, Bartlett, professor of botany, who had a broad spectrum of scientific interests from botany to the history of science and who was to inspire her later forays into ethnobotany. And she becomes extremely important because she's an ethnobotanist. She's very interested in the plant collection of tribal communities. So she's, commu she's sort of linking up uh, not just uh, the plant collection in terms of uh, her interest in, uh, in uh, the, the collection of uh, plants by Adivasi communities, I think is, is particularly interesting and important. She's, a, she's appointed as professor of botany at Maharaja College of Science in 1932, followed by a five-year stint at the Sugar Cane Breeding Institute in Coimbatore, where she devoted herself to genetic studies contributing to the breeding of sugarcane. She traveled to Edinburgh in 1939 to take part in the Seventh International Congress of Genetics and was compelled to remain in Britain for the duration of the war. From 40 to 45, she was assistant cytologist to C.D. Darlington at the John Innes Institute, and she worked on the origin and evolution of cultivated plants, resulting in the chromosome atlas of cultivated plants, which she co-authored with Darlington and which became an important source for cytological work on the economic plants of the world. She returns to India in 1948, meeting Nehru on the plane, and her career as a national scientist be begins. By 1955, she was the director of the Central Botanical Laboratory of the Government of India at Lucknow. She was to become the fellow of the Linnean Society of London, the Royal Geographical Society, the Asiatic Society of Bengal, the Royal Asiatic Society of London, and the Indian Academy of Sciences. So she was a very original thinker. One of her biographers, C.S. Subramaniam, a scientific contemporary of hers, saw as an original thinker doing epochal work, I quote, 
on intergeneric hybrids such as Saccharum zea, Saccharum eranthus, Saccharum imperata, all to do with sugarcane. She was publishing articles in Nature and Saccharum sorghum. Uh, sorghum. Her pioneering work was on the cytogenetics of Saccharum officinarum and interspecific and intergenic hybrids involving sugarcane. So her career is particularly interesting. She is interested uh, in, in the confluence of Chinese and Malayan and Indian floristic elements in the Northeast. She's a, a biogeographer in the way in which we talked about. Her work demonstrated that uh, taxa have the special facility for breaking across ecological or geographical barriers. And I think though cytology was her forte as, as Subramanian notes, her work embraced genetics evolution by to cytography and ethnobotany. And she was breaking out against the taxonomic practices imposed by Q because she was much more interested in local botany. And I think that work, of, that aspect of her work is very, very important. She was interested in regional plants and their practical uses through traditional knowledge and local culture and people. And she was chaffing at the constraints of Q and Q, remember, still held a st strong, important position in post-colonial uh, India. And she was, of course, very much hemmed by her, um, by our limited, by uh, the fact that she faced the patriarchy of science, both in Britain and in India, where the Sugarcane Breeding Institute, um, which was headed by uh, Venkatraman, uh, a Brahmin, sought to thwart her article, uh, uh, which, was, which was not sent up, uh, to nature. Uh, so I quote here um, uh, a letter between Gates and Darlington, both of whom are her referees, two white men, um, uh, who uh, both uh, sort of uh, uh, damned her with faint praise. And here she, she's writing um, to Darlington. She doesn't know that he's also damning her with faint praise. She's writing to him. I quote, it has taken seven months to undo the harm that Reginald Ruggles Gates, who was married to Mary, Mary Stopes um, and was later divorced, I quote, did in the course of a simple day spent in Coimbatore. Mr. Benkentraben was completely taken in by the professor's keen interest in the work done at Coimbatore, his fund of information and his gracious matter, gracious manner. Hence the doubt expressed not to me, but to Venkatraman, about the validity of the Sacrum Zia cross stuck in the expert's brain and my note to nature was not sent up to the director of agriculture for necessary permission to publish it outside India. I very nearly decided to leave the station as a result of all this and life became very complicated. So she was really limited by the patriarchy of science both in Britain and India, which, which were trying to foil her publication efforts, but her note to nature did come out in the end. And she published several different, uh, uh, she published several times more in nature. So the 1950s, I think, uh, is very important for Indian science. Uh, it's, a, it's a time when um, the, the, the Botanical Survey of India is being reorganized. And um, Janaki Amal's role, both in challenging Q and in challenging um, uh, uh, the patriarchy of science, I think, has to be recognized. And I think this, this particular story, when she became the director of the Botanical Survey in, in India, uh, and she, she is very important. She divided India into six uh, cytogeographic units or circles, each with its own herbarium and cytotaxonomic laboratory. She wanted to have a central laboratory in Calcutta, which she succeeded. And her plans, of course, in the beginning came into difficulty where uh, uh, a Jesuit, was, uh, Shantapu, was appointed over her head as the director of the BSI, and she uh, lost. But later on, of course, uh, following her memorandum, the Botanical Survey of India was reorganized in four regional centers, Coimbatore 1955, Pune 1955, Shillong 1955, and Dehradun 1956, with their headquarters in Calcutta, uh, albeit under a government-appointed chief botanist. So her story, I think, is um, extremely interesting and important, and allows us to decenter uh, the, the, the story of plant, uh, the practices, of plant collecting. She retired from the Botanical Survey in 1959 uh, and was asked by the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research to help in their new regional laboratories. So that's a letter from her to Darlington. And there's a fantastic correspondence which you can look at in the uh, Bodleian. Uh, and unfortunately, and this is a tragedy of Indian scientists, all her herbarium specimens and papers were destroyed uh, when she died 
uh, and when their house was sold and no Indian archive even bothered to either collect her, her slide collection or her papers. So if, if, if you want to see her handwriting, uh, you'll find a few letters in the BSI in Calcutta, but the rest of them in the Bodleian. Uh, one of her notable first, she was the first female employee of the RHS in Wisley. And um, uh, that is uh, one of the plants that she, uh, she, the, she hybridized the Magnolia cobus. And what have we, one thing what we've done is we are telling this story and narrating it through taking an exhibition back from Kew. We did this in 2016 and I met Romita Ray there. Um, so this, uh, there's, you can see in the picture, you can see um, uh, Gina, um, uh, who is from uh, Q. So the Q sent their publicity team uh, and their head of the publications department. Um, we paid 40,000 um, pounds to, to Q to bring this already curated exhibition to BSI. So I think the decolonial exercise needs to go a bit further than that. Um, and uh, uh, we also supplemented it with an exhibition uh, on Janaki Amal, which happened for the first time along with the Q exhibition. So yeah, you actually, actually had to enter um, the space uh, on Hooker through uh, the Janika Amal sort of exhibition. And the BSI itself had to sort of work very hard to get its collections on Amal together, though she had founded uh, the BSI in effect. And that again is an own story of how the, the BSI is trying to decolonize itself. Um, so there's a Ministry of Environment and Climate Change uh, opening the meeting uh, we had several new early career scholars there. Um, and we also opened it up in further to schools. So uh, for the first time, the BSI uh, scientists opened up their collections to um, secondary school children. Uh, and uh, we, um, and uh, here's the school children at the exhibition. Um, and uh, we produce information leaflets uh, about the history of plant collecting in English and Bengali. And we also took this exhibition to Mysore. Um, and of course our digital repatriation goes alongside thousands of Indian plants that were digitized for the first time through a project with the Natural History Museum uh, where we got a Rutherford grant through uh, uh, the yes. efforts of uh, Rani Prakash. Uh, and that was, again was a very important exercise. Uh, and uh, that's my last slide. Um, how do we decolonize um, more, uh, bringing in uh, local plant knowledge into the space of, uh, uh, into these museum spaces, um, for example, the Indian Museum and the Botanical Survey of India, um, looking much more at indigenous plant heritage and sacred groves, uh, opening up the exclusive space of the museum, a much wider public engagement, decolonizing a bureaucratic mind. There's been some interesting work done by Bhattacharya in a Xavier magazine on uh, the way in which the Forest Survey of India uh, and the spaces of the Forest Survey are, are, are very bureauc bureaucratically in, uh, and still co very colonial in how it needs to be opened up. And I think the same you could say for BSI, uh, whose new flora of India is still a long way away and retelling the story of Indian botany uh, as emerging from its colonial origins and moving um, to embrace its tribal indigenous and gendered approaches would be one way uh, forward. So that is sort of my wish list and I'll stop sharing there.